Eight seven. All right, let's uh, let's get started. I'm 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 so thrilled. So uh, for anybody on the line that doesn't know me, I'm Lori Leshen. I'm the president of WPI, and I want to welcome you all to our university lecture, or as I will refer to today's session. Uh, this is mountain climbing class that you have joined here today, and I'm especially thrilled that. Our guide in uh, in today's mountain climbing class is the <coughs> wonderful Dr. Cornell West, who I've had a great chance to spend time with here over these last few minutes. Um, many of you know I grew up in, in Arizona, and so I grew up climbing mountains, which is really a glorious way to spend time. Um, from the foot of the mountain, the task seems both impossible and exhilarating, and the journey can be fraught with both really exciting moments and really crushing setbacks. And why, why go through that? You might ask, why climb that mountain? And I think it's because you wanna to get to the summit and you wanna see that gorgeous view of you without boundaries up, down to the sides. And, and uh, the view from the top of a mountain makes us believe that, that anything is possible. And, Dr. West is here today and talk to us about race and democracy. And that is a mountain. That subject is a mountain. And I don't really know what he's gonna tell us. I know it'll be uh, insightful and exciting and entertaining, but I, I can imagine he might talk about how democracy only works. We can only reach the top of that mountain if everyone has a voice. And if everyone's voice is not only tolerated, but, but welcomed and engaged, and that quest is a tough climb. It's, it's an uncomfortable one for a lot of folks. There are lots of obstacles on that trail. And um, I can't wait to hear Dr. West about your view of that climb, of that journey. And here at WPI, we, we exist to transform lives, to translate knowledge into action, to address the world's greatest challenges and to revolutionize STEM. And that my friends is also a mountain. We will only reach the top. We will only fulfill our mission if we address issues of racial and other inequities that for too long, really for all time, have held our disciplines, our institutions, and all of STEM back from reaching the summit of our mountain. And we really have to face head on into the rocks on the trail, geologist, you can tell, right? So I'm, I'm using my mountain analogy here, but we've got to face head on into those rocks on the trail, into those challenges, to those who say we can't or even shouldn't try to climb this mountain. There are even those who actually actively kind of try and push us off, push us off the trail as we ascend. And I think it's really important that we spend the time to build our conviction, our strength, our endurance so that we can go forward together. The thing I, um, I, I told Dr. West this in our, one of our conversations a bit earlier, the thing I appreciate, one of the things I appreciate, but one of the things I appreciate most about him is that he approaches this climb, the mountain that we have to climb together here with, um, you know, with, with a nod to history, of course, but, but also with great love and heart and joy. And so I think as we look to build our strength, our endurance, our resilience in the fight for justice, that we've got to climb the mountain with that love and heart and joy, or we really don't have any chance to reach the top. And so if the concepts of, you know, fighting and climbing seem at odds with the concepts of love and heart and joy, well, you're in the right class tonight and you got the right instructor today. So I wanna welcome you all to mountain climbing class and glad you're with us on this journey. And now I'd like to hand it over to our amazing, one of our most important mountaineer, mountaineers and my climbing partner, uh, Wally Sobiejo, our amazing provost. Wally, uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Laurie, for that wonderful introduction. It's really for me um, today, a special pleasure to welcome our university lecturer, uh, Professor Cornell West. Next, please. <clears throat> so as I look at the university lecture, we all know for us, this is perhaps our most special moment in sort of inviting to WPI, someone that we hold in high esteem, somebody that is a thought leader that can share with us uh, perspectives of the world um, from the mountaintop. Next, please. So Cornell is known, of course, to all of us. He's 
prominent, provocative, democratic intellect, a professor of philosophy at Harvard. But to me, Cornell is a friend that I shared a significant part of my life as a professor at Princeton with, as somebody that I have grown to love and respect for his integrity, for his thinking, and for his humanity. And he is someone that we know, of course, through his public persona. But to me, he is somebody that has lived his ideas in ways that are compelling, impactful within the US and beyond. He's taught at Princeton, the Theological Seminary, Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, and the University of Paris. Um, and he's somebody that established himself as a young prodigy at Harvard and at Princeton and has gone on to do what I call profound thinking about democracy and race matters. And if you think about those two areas and you play on those ideas, you sort of realize that in the last uh, year and perhaps in the last few decades, much of what we have to deal with America has to do with democracy and race matters, issues of social justice and issues of equity and issues that really concern us all in ways that are important for the good of America and perhaps for the good of the world. And in Cornell's work, he does what really ranges from work that is as deep as it can get, but also work that connects to people, living out lives in ways that are truly exemplified by just the range of his contributions. Next, please. And so for me, uh, especially looking back at the last year, you sort of realize that today's talk with a focus on race and democracy is as important as it could ever be. For those of us, as we went through the issues of democracy in America in the past year or so, we realized just how fragile our system is. And as we encountered issues of race and racial justice, where various groups from African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Hispanics, indigenous Americans, and other minority populations encountered issues of race, we really came to realize, especially in recent time, the importance of really important thinking in a way that can move our society beyond where we are today. Next. And, and so for me, what does this have to do with WPI? WPI is a STEM institution. And we all know that through the intersections with STEM, we can offer many solutions in ways that are unique and important. And I think that even in a STEM institution, ensuring that we have informed perspectives on democracy and race matters really is critical as we begin to think of our role in building social justice in America. And as we do this, the education of our community is important. Uh, we as a community need to be better informed on issues of race and racial justice in ways that inform our behavior. And we need to really appreciate all Americans within this context and really understand the history of the context, the thinking behind the potential connections with STEM. Next, please. And so for me, the thing that moves me is not only Cornell's intellect and his thinking as a thought leader in issues of race and democracy, but also his ability to provoke deep emotion as we can see here in a recent interaction with Don Lemon, where you know, we see the great humanity just exemplified in these kinds of interactions. So Cornell for me is also someone who's equally comfortable in the academic arena where he can talk philosophy and religion and ethics with the very best, as he is with talking to common folk in ways that really help us to think through ideas and help us to deeply understand our world around us. Next. So with that, um, it really is a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to say a few words and what is the beginning of what we all know is our most special talk uh, in the academic uh, program at WPI. Last year, of course, the speaker was Professor Robert Langer, 
was the Institute professor at MIT. We often call the Edison of medicine. But for me, it's really a thrill. It's an honor to have Professor Cornell West share a few thoughts and ideas on race and democracy, which I feel are some of the most important issues that we as a community and we as a country, we as a world have to deal with today. And to introduce Professor West, it's a pleasure for me to, to ask our colleague, uh, Lamin Sanya, who also taught with us at Princeton, to say a few words about Cornell. Lamin has written a book called Cornell West Matters, and so he knows more than I do a lot more about Cornell and the impact that Cornell has had in a profound way. Lamin. You need to unmute. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Soboyejo. I should say Provo Soboyejo. Um, I'm very, very pleased to introduce my friend, my mentor, my colleague, uh, Cornell West. Uh, it's very difficult to talk about Cornell West because he's a unique entity not only in American philosophical space, but also in global philosophical space. Because if I re refer to the book I wrote on him and the debate in Europe, how he reflect uh, about truth and all this human being, about humanity, uh, Cornel West is uh, one of the greatest thinker now in the world. Cornel West was born in July, on July 2nd of 1953 in Tulsa, Oklahoma, as a son of a teacher and military base employee. Cornel West learns the history of the black struggle at a very young age. He was educated, as you said, in the greatest American university, Harvard and Princeton, and uh, he always try to work on the culture of alienation with a particular focus on race. Uh, what, one of the more important things from my point of view, Colonel Breen, is how you, the status, the person's status in society does not delimit their humanity or their truth. He, has examined this theme in over 30 books and throughout his colorful career that extend from the lecture hall to the sound studio or the set of CNN. I can best describe Cornel West and his legacy by examining the Greek philosopher Socrates. I think this is the key to understand Cornel West from my point of view. Socrates, whom Cornel West admires and often quotes, opposes himself to those elites who defend themselves as wise and sophists who claim to be able to teach the whole world in action for remuneration. According to his own teacher, Plato, Socrates was the first philosopher because he desires he desired wisdom more than to appear wise. Perhaps this is a Socratic posture, posture that Cornel West seeks to embody. I am very, very pleased to introduce the 2021 university guest lecturer, Brother Cornel West. But uh, to paraphrase the great Marvin Gaye, who wondered aloud what's going on, I ask what's going on, Brother Cornel West, what's going on now? Oh, that's beautiful, my brother. That is beautiful, my brother. What a blessing. What a privilege, what an honor to be here at WPI. My dear brother Lamine, anytime I set eyes on you, it brings great joy to my heart. I have such precious memories of our teaching together at Princeton. You know, I consider you one of the grand and distinguished intellectuals to emerge 
from the continent of Africa in the last number of decades trained at the universities in Paris, teaching both in, in New Jersey at Princeton, as well as uh, Dakar and outside of Lagos in Nigeria, and now Worcester Politic, Polytechnic Institute. So very, very blessed to have you. And of course, I, I think of, of your magnificent mother, uh, just uh, uh, it, it brings tears to my eyes to think of her thinking of you and the heights that you have achieved, my brother. Thank you so very much for being who you are. And it was you who introduced me to our dear brother Wally. We knew at the time, given his magnificent work at Princeton, he's so very loved and respected uh, that he was going on to the bigger and better things. And he's gone beyond Princeton to WPI, Distinguished Provost. WPI, so very, very blessed to have him too. I've been so very glad to meet the captain of the ship, Sister President Laurie herself. What a force for good she has been in her seven short years in guiding, leading, shaping. She's been a thermostat, not, not a thermometer. She didn't come in reflecting what was in place. She built on the best of it, but she's been shaping it directing it in such a magnificent manner. And uh, uh, WPI is so, so very blessed to, to have her leadership really does matter. She is an intellectual gem as scientists. She is an existential jewel as a human being. Uh, uh, and then there's Beth Eddy. I don't have language for Sister Beth. Uh, she's one of the finest graduate students to matriculate through the Department of Religion at Princeton University. I was blessed to be in many classrooms with her. We were talking about the readings that we did many, many years ago on conceptions of the comic vis-a-vis -vis conceptions of the tragic. She has written the finest philosophical treatment of Ralph Waldo Ellison, the black writer, the author of Invisible Man and Juneteenth and Shadow and Act. And uh, the fact that she decided to spend the years that she has at WPI is quite impressive to me. It says something about the quality of the institution that they would have a Beth Eddy as professor. And I look forward to the dialogue, my dear brother Rob, and of course I look forward to the dialogue with all of the magnificent students. Indeed, indeed. So let me try to put forward some formulation just to whet your appetite. I've come to actually be dialogical. I've come to learn and to listen as well as to present. But I hope I say something that unsettles the students that unnerves the students, that forces students to wrestle with what kind of human beings they will choose to be in their move from womb to tomb. So, so Brother Lamine, you're absolutely right. I always begin on a Socratic note, that powerful line of 38A in Plato's Apology, the unexamined life is not a life for the human. We know our English word human comes from the Latin humando. Humando means burial, that we are vanishing organisms. We are disappearing creatures. We are featherless, two-legged, linguistically conscious creatures born between urine and feces on our way to the culinary delight of terrestrial worms. We're not here that long in space and time. And the question becomes, what kind of human being will we choose to be? Now, any talk about race, any talk about gender, sexual orientation, class, empire, has to begin at this deep humanistic level and see what democratic possibilities can be projected in light of the kind of human beings we choose to be. Because there cannot be any democratic projects 
if you don't have certain kinds of persons who are willing to participate, who are willing to undergo certain kinds of cultivation and maturation such that they can enter public life without humiliation and raise their voices to shape their collective destiny. So the first thing you do when you talk about race or democracy is begin with oneself in a Socratic mode. I tell this to my students all the time. Brother Lamine here has heard me say this now for 30 years. Namely that we've got to learn how to die in order to learn how to live. We got to learn how to die in order to come to terms with race, vicious legacies of white supremacy. We've got to learn how to die in order to project possibilities of democracy in which the dignity of those Sly Stone called everyday people, the sanctity of those James Cleveland called ordinary people are able to straighten their backs up and believe enough in themselves and respect themselves enough in order to follow the anthem of black people, my own community, which is lift every voice. But it doesn't say lift every echo. We're not talking about extensions of echo chambers. We're talking about lifting every voice and our voice is like our fingerprint. It's distinct, it is sing singular, it is irreducible and irreproducible, but you've got to fight to find your voice. Now, Brother, Le Bro Brother Lemon had written the best book ever done on a crack vessel like me, Cornell West Matters. I salute him for that. He makes the point that I've always viewed my calling. When I have a calling, not so much a career, Career is always a means to the calling. I have a vocation, not just a profession. The profession is just a means to the vocation. And that calling and vocation has to do with being a blues man in the life of the mind, a jazz man in the world of ideas. And the blues ain't nothing but a personal narrative of a individual or collective catastrophe lyrically expressed. That's what Beth Eddy is wrestling with in, Ralph El in her marvelous book on Ralph Ellison and Kenneth Burke, which means what? Which means that if you're on intimate terms with catastrophe, it means you're looking at the world through the lens of those who are suffering, through the lens of those Franz Fanon called the wretched of the earth. And that cuts across color, it cuts across nation, cuts across gender. It's a human affair, but what gets in the way? these institutional and structural impediments, the legalizing of unscientific constructs like race, but it takes on tremendous potency and power when it's institutionalized and legalized, but it's always inseparable from economic forms of production, predatory capitalism, but of course there's white supremacy under communism and socialism too but it merges in the modern world tied to predatory capitalism with imperial expansions in various parts of the world, be it the new world with our precious indigenous brothers and sisters. And we know so very well here in Massachusetts who they are. It could be in Africa, it could be in Asia, it could be in Latin America. It could be our precious Irish brothers and sisters dealing with 800 years of very ugly British colonialism. Meaning what? Meaning that when you start with the notion of how do we come to terms with what it means to be human at the highest level of what the Greeks call arate, excellence, moral excellence, spiritual excellence, what kind of virtues, and of course, Sister Beth understands this is in some ways a connection with our dear brother Jeff Stout, who has written some of the most profound texts on virtues. Virtues like courage, virtues like magnanimity, virtues like, I, give, I show my own Christian bias here, faith, hope, and above all, love. How do we engage in forms of growth and development in such a way that we can attempt to exemplify in body and enact virtues such that we stay in contact with the humanity of other persons that allows us to be 
real forces for good over against white supremacy in its various forms and its various styles. And that's where Socrates plays a fundamental role because Socrates says, we human beings must engage in painful self-examination, self-interrogation, self-scrutiny. And you must call into question certain assumptions and presuppositions about who you are, who you think you are. And when you give up certain assumptions and presuppositions, certain dogma, certain doctrine, that's a form of death. And that particular form of death unleashes new life. So there is no paideia at its highest level, deep education, not cheap schooling. We're not talking about gaining access to skills and information. We're talking about deep education, which is, gain, which is cultivating critical orientations, which is trying to enact maturation of compassionate souls and personalities and individuals but it's also a formation of attention, trying to attend to the things that matter, not the superficial things, instant gratification, status, wealth, power, as if somehow those things have to be constitutive of our fundamental conceptions of the kind of human being we are. Yes, we may all want money. Yes, we may want some status. Yes, we may want a certain kind of position, but in the end, like in the death of Ivan Illich in Leo Tolstoy's great classic of 1886, something is fundamentally missing. And what is missing is what the virtues can provide. And those virtues are always couched in stories and narratives and deeply enmeshed in traditions. So the question becomes, what kinds of stories and narratives can we muster? What kinds of elements of tradition can we highlight such that we can hit vicious legacies of white supremacy head on. Now note, what we're not doing is we don't begin a dialogue with name calling and finger pointing. No, 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 no. We begin on the Socratic note, self-examination of what really Anto Antonio Gramsci even cuts deeper. He calls it a critical historical self-inventory in which we learn how to situate and locate ourselves in stories and traditions in such a way that we can accent the best of who we are and downplay the worst allow the worst to die in order for the best to emerge. But in talking about race as a social construct, but white supremacist legacies at con as concretized, institutionalized, and legalized practices that wound and scar and bruise precious human beings, be they indigenous peoples, be they Asians, be they black folk, my own folk be they brown folk. And yes, our vanilla brothers and sisters are part of the discourse of race and they can be wounded in a variety of different ways too. They can be scarred too. They can be subjugated too. They can be dominated too. But in that vicious legacy of white supremacy, the white skin privilege becomes one particular element that has to also be part of our examination not because people ought not to be able to be white. I don't believe that whiteness is reduced solely to white supremacy. I know a white brother named John Brown who died for black people, who loved black people more than some black people love themselves. I know a rabbi named Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel who fought vigorously against white supremacy as a particular white brother emerging out of Eastern Europe confined to the lower echelons given the vicious attacks of not just the Nazis, but of other anti-Jewish elites even prior to the Nazis. But in America, he was constituted as white. I know Irish brothers like David Montgomery, deeply anti-racist and anti-white supremacist. So whiteness does not equal white supremacy. Human beings who are characterized as white can make moral and political choices over against white supremacy. That's what we're seeing with the Vanilla Brothers and Sisters, at least so many Vanilla Brothers and Sisters in Minneapolis right now every night. The vast majority, white brothers and sisters choosing to stand up against white supremacy given what has happened to our dear brother. 
Floyd, George Perry Floyd Jr., as well as our dear brother, Dante Wright. And we would say the same thing about Breonna Taylor, the same thing about Sandra Bland. We can go on and on and on. But this Socratic dimension must be highlighted in order to free us from any narrow, ossified labels. So to talk these days about identity politics, identity politics, I'm white, I'm black, I'm gay, I'm straight, so-and-so. None of those labels determine your moral choices. Clarence Thomas is a beautiful black man. I'm a decent looking black man. We both black, we both could be beat up by white supremacist police. But he chooses certain directions, the side with the wealthy and the power. I choose another direction, trying to be in deep solidarity with those Trumps who know and call the wretched of the earth and highly suspicious of any elite concentration of power, no matter what color, no matter what nation, no matter what gender. It's a moral and a spiritual choice. That's what I've come to highlight my brothers and sisters of all colors here at WPI. You see, that we need to be freed from these narrow, myopic conceptions of feeling as if you're locked in a certain label and you're freed with Socratic energy. I don't have to tell students here at the STEM institution about the ways in which curiosity and perplexity and intellectual creativity can be tied to technological innovation. Well, that same level of vitality and vibrancy needs to be also at work in the moral sphere, in the spiritual sphere, in the political sphere. And at that point, even being a scientist doesn't privilege you. Every scientist still has to come to terms with what kind of human being am I going to be? Will I choose integrity, honesty, decency, generosity, service to others? Or will I follow the hounds of hell, which are greed and hatred and hypocrisy and manipulating fear and intimidation in order to justify superiority and to justify elevated status. Those are human choices, whether you're majoring in engineering or whether you're writing poetry, whether you're black, white, red, Jewish, Catholic, Muslim, Arab, Palestinian, Ethiopian, Nigerian, Haitian, across the board. And this is precisely the tradition that I come out of because I come out of a black people produce a great tradition of after being chronically hated for 400 years, 244 years of day-to-day, -day, night by night, barbaric, torture-driven slavery. And another 100 years of neo-slavery, of Jim Crow and Jane Crow and American terrorism and every two and a half days for 50 years, a lynching taking place, some black body swaying in the southern breeze as the great Billy Holiday from Baltimore City sang about with the Jewish brother Maripo writing the lyrics. But in the face of that kind of institutional, institutional hatred, producing love warriors, here comes Frederick Douglass, here comes Ida B. Wells, here comes Harriet Tubman. Here comes Sojourner Truth. Here comes A. Philip Randolph. Here comes Martin Luther King Jr. Yes, Brother Lamine. Here comes Marvin Gaye. Here comes Jimmy Baldwin. Love forces us to take off the mask. We know we cannot live within, but fear we cannot live without. Here comes Martin Luther King Jr., Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer. I could go on and on the love warriors, and then not just talking about social justice, because justice is what love looks like in public. Yes, just like tenderness is what love feels like in private, but justice and love are not the same thing. Great Ranho Niebuhr used to say, 
Any justice as only justice soon degenerates into something less than justice. You need deep love, care, concern. But our precious Jewish brothers and sisters call hesed in Hebrew scripture. That loving kindness, that steadfast love for the orphan, the widow, the fatherless, the motherless, the oppressed, the subjugated, the persecuted. And that hesed, that deep love animates the justice. But justice itself can become an idol. It, become, it can become associated with self-righteousness if it's not predicated on a genuine care and concern for the folk who you are con in solidarity with. And that, in that sense, it's a force. It's part of the genius of Hebrew scripture. The justice is not an abstract norm only. John Rawls has this, in his great classic theory of justice, he has a role to play in terms of looking at justice as an abstract norm to help us come to terms with the way in which institutional arrangements are organized. But, but justice I'm talking about is a force inside of your soul. It's a fire inside of you that won't allow you to hold your peace. And if you don't say and do something, the rocks are going to shout out. It tries to get you to see more clearly and more broadly, to feel more deeply, to shatter callousness and indifference, and then to act more courageously. Anytime you talk about race and democracy, you always all remember that wonderful letter that the great Henry James wrote to Robert Louis Stevenson, on July 10th, 1901, where he says, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. Now we know this is true in science. Thomas Kuhn has taught us about the various ways in which paradigms and theoretical frameworks can allow us to see, but also cheat us of seeing at the same time. That's why dogma must always be called into question. That's why the scientific temperament is always one of fallibility, open to revision, trying to come to terms with the evidence, but the evidence often is underdetermined, and therefore there's a multiplicity of interpretations that can flow from that evidence. Yes. How do we broaden what we see? But when it comes to life, when it comes to politics, when it comes to democracy and coming to terms with race or gender or class or empire or homophobia or transphobia or any ideological perspective that loses sight of the dignity of human beings, you see, that we also have to broaden how, what we see, the lens to which we view the world, the broadening, the shattering of our parochialisms, but also to feel more deeply. Now, one of the problems of talking about beginning with Socrates and talking about race is that given all the wonderful things about Socrates, well, what an example of intellectual integrity, questioning, interrogating, but we also know that Socrates never sheds a tear, at least he never sheds a tear in the narratives in which his agency is rendered and those of Plato and Xenophon and Aristophanes. And you can't talk about race, you can't talk about any form of evil without shedding a tear. My hunch is that Socrates certainly loved wisdom and he loved the pursuit of truth, but it doesn't look like he really loved anybody because anybody who loves Human beings will shed a tear. Just like all of us, for the most part, will probably shed a tear at our mother's funeral. Socratic self-mastery and self-control is not appropriate. Allow the tears to overflow. That's where Hebrew scripture begins with tears and cries of affliction of an oppressed people. Because when you're talking about issues like race or white supremacy, you're talking about a people who are vulnerable, and the Latin for vulnerable is vulno, it's a wound, a deep wound. And the question becomes, once we are traumatized and wounded, will we choose to be wounded helpers rather than wounded hurters? That's a moral achievement, that's a spiritual breakthrough to transfigure our wounds into serving others. 
That's Amos. That's Esther. That's Isaiah. That's Jesus. That's Muhammad. It goes in secular forms as well. Those secular prophets who use their gifts as means of empowering others. In my tradition, it's called kenosis, emptying of oneself, donating of oneself, sacrificing oneself in order to do what? In order to spread acid, in order to change the world, not just in the name of justice, but driven by a deep compassion and love and solidarity that requires a certain kind of prophetic witness. So you've got the Socratic, you've got the prophetic. Prophetic tears, shattering numbness. Socratic questioning, shattering dogma. Race, a dogma. Gender, a dogma. How do you shatter it? Raising your voices, organizing, bring, bringing power and pressure to bear. You think, for example, of WPI 1865 founded. First dear sister Audrey graduated 1957. That's almost 100 years. And she, in some ways, uh, was not even officially there, even though she is a dignified and a as much a uh, distinguished graduate as anybody else. But you had to wait even till 1968. That was a dogma, male supremacy, a dogma, white supremacy is like that. The founding of the United States had a dogma sitting at the center. White supremacy was like a serpent wrapped around the legs of the table upon which the founding fathers sounded, signed the Declaration of Independence. It haunted America then. You end up fighting a civil war over white supremacy, but and over that institution of slavery, but no reference to slavery in the Constitution. That's denial. That's what James Baldwin called innocence. That innocence itself is the crime. How can you be authorizers of such devastation and view yourself as innocent? Grow up, America. You can grow powerful. You can go grow rich. You can grow wealthy. But will you grow up? That's what we're here to talk about. The education, the paideia, the critical sensibility, the compassion that must flow in order for maturity to take place as a democratic experiment because your democratic experiment was predicated on somebody else's land. Your democratic experiment was based on enslaved labor of precious Africans and patriarchal households in the private sphere that didn't allow women access to the public sphere. And it was early on anti-Catholic and anti-Jewish. And yes, America has grown. America has matured. Absolutely, why? Because persons decided they wanted to be certain kinds of human beings of integrity and willing to raise their voices and bring power and pressure to bear to make America better. And every generation has to make those kinds of choices. And if not, you lose your democracy. Just like the Civil War, we almost lost it, but here come 200,000 black soldiers to join the Union Army to break the back of the Confederacy. And yet, Union Army won the war, but white supremacy we won the peace after Reconstruction and another 100 years of neo-slavery. 1960, here comes Martin King and others with, with the movement for not just civil rights, but for freedom, justice, motivated by deep compassion for the suffering, not just of black people, but beginning with black people and spilling over to poor white, spilling over to Brown, spilling over to Asia, pushing through 1965 immigration laws that would allow the pushing back of white supremacist immigration laws to open America to the whole world. And America has been fundamentally changed since 1965. All you gotta do is look around the country. I'm sure all you gotta do is look around WPI and see all of the beautiful voluntary immigrants who have been able to come in since 1965, in part as a result of the Black Freedom Movement. 
in their struggle against white supremacy. Just a few months ago, black voters, especially black women voters, helped save, rescue American democracy from neo-fascist possible options led by old brother Don Trump. Black folk again, at our best, coming to the rescue. The black freedom struggle, leaven in the American democratic loaf. When it's strong, it expands democracy with positive repercussions for everybody. Gay brothers and lesbian sisters and non-binary precious folk. Rights, civil rights, liberties expanded, resources made available. But then the shrinking and then the emptying out. And that's very much where we are now. I won't go on too, too long. I want to save good time for question and answer. But where are we now? We look at it through Socratic lens. Look at it through prophetic lens. Where we're at a moment of unbelievable spiritual decay. It's hard to communicate with each other. It's hard to manifest sustained empathy with each other. It's like a Chekhov play or Eugene O'Neill dramatic rendition. People just can't even communicate. People can't even listen long enough to try to engage in Socratic self-examination. It's prejudgments. You are, you are subsumed under this label. You don't have nothing to say to me. You cancel. I don't have time for you. Why? Because we're so not just polarized. We are gangsterized. As Martin Luther King Jr. used to put it, let's see, it's the 11th commandment, get over by any means and thou shalt not get caught. So that the market way of life has become so pervasive, everybody's for sale and everybody's just about money and status and spectacle and integrity pushed to the side, honesty pushed to the side. I just want mine my career, my job, my status. I can't trust anybody. It is survival of the slickest. And I want to be rich. I want to be smart. No, let the phones be smart. You can't talk about race unless you're talking about courage and wisdom and compassion. Because there are a whole lot of smart Nazis who were thugs. There's a whole lot of white supremacists, a whole lot of white male and white supremacists who were very smart. Some of them were professors at Harvard. I'm sure there were some professors at WPI in the last 156 years. Very smart, but still deeply racist, deeply xenophobic. And it's inside all of us. That's why we all have to learn how to die in order to learn how to live. But in this moment of spiritual decay, spiritual malnutrition, moral, constipation, running amok, moral decrepitude, relative eclipse of the virtues. That's old hat. Socrates, no, push him aside. We want Thrasymachus, might makes right. Power determines what morality is. Mm, no democracy can survive based on Thrasymachus, based on what Thrasymachus represents. Might makes right. It's a Hobbes in war of all against all. It's just power, power, power all the way down with no moral and spiritual dimension at all. And with technological innovation under the aegis of narcissism, under the aegis of narrow forms of tribalism, under the aegis of obsession with money or worshiping at the altar of a golden calf called money. You lose your democracy. We almost lost it. We could easily lose it soon. And neo-fascists can easily feel that vacuum of spiritual vacuity. And what is neo-fascism? The rule of big money, the rule of big military, 
a strong man as Pied Piper to convince folk that their chaos, their hurts, their wounds can only be cured or at least attended to if they learn how to scapegoat the most vulnerable. It could be immigrants at the border. It could be Arabs, it could be Jews, it could be black folk, it could be women, gays, let we got a whole list of those to be sca scapegoated. And so it makes it almost impossible for multiracial solidarity to confront the most powerful. That's in many ways where we are now. And I haven't said too much about the militarism abroad. We can get into that because it's very true that the bombs dropped in Yemen and Afghanistan land in poor and working class communities in America. Now we're pulling out of Afghanistan. Now we pulling out of the equipment to be sent to Saudi Arabia to intervene in Yemen. Brother Biden is surprising me. He might be an LBJ. He aspires to be an FDR. We shall see. But I think he's moving in the right direction. If we're going to sustain any democratic possibilities and come to terms with the major impediment of American democracy, which happens to be a white supremacy grounded in a predatory capitalist way of being in the world. So the economic dimension of race is always already intertwined with the ideological one. Race is not an isolated factor. It is grounded and immersed. It is entangled in obsession with money and power. It leads toward, if not morally and spiritually regulated, a greed and a domination. Let me end on the blue note and we can open it up. And blue note, as Brother Lamine knows, is a, it's a note of love and joy. In the midst of catastrophe, to look clearly, to feel deeply and to act courageously in the face of any form of evil like white supremacy with style and a smile generates a deep sense of joy flowing from solidarity. You can see the joy on the streets actually in Minneapolis tonight on your TV screen. But it's rooted in a love, not just of neighbor, but it's a love of a truth, a truth that is painful about ourselves, about our society, about our world. It's a love of beauty. When Billie Holiday sings about strange fruit, she sings it in a beautiful way, a tender way, a soulful way. And soul ain't nothing but the sharing of a soothing sweetness against the backdrop of a grim catastrophe. So you got to keep that joy in it. And one of the ways in which black folk have been able to look unflinchingly at 400 years of a system that has failed them, especially their poor and working classes under slavery and neo-slavery. And now we do in fact have unprecedented opportunities for the black middle class, but with mass incarceration, decrepit schools, shattered families, indecent housing, not enough health care even available. It still is a failure from that vantage point, and we won't even get into the policing, the failure of the police. But in the face of that kind of failure, in the face of those kinds of wounds, these love warriors keep coming. These freedom fighters keep coming. These wounded healers keep coming. And if we together can learn how to see and feel and act in a way that can sustain a democratic project, then we have at least a hope. I didn't say optimism. Optimism is about whether the evidence would allow you. No, no, no. Action becomes part of the evidence. So we don't 
have enough people who are choosing to be human in this way, if we don't have enough people who are willing to tell the truth, we don't have enough people who are willing to seek justice, we don't have enough people who are willing to serve and sacrifice and maybe even die, then you'll lose your democracy. And this is true not just in the United States, it's true all around the world, our precious Africans, precious Caribbeans, precious Asians, precious Euro Europeans, precious Latin Americans. You see. Do we have what it takes? It's always an open question. Depends on who we are, what we choose to do. Depends on whether we can turn around those hounds of hell, get some curtailment or some accountability of the greed and the hatred, the envy and the contempt. And maybe then the crucial role of the arts, and I want to highlight the role of the arts at a STEM university, never downplay the poets, the writers, the painters, the architects, because oftentimes they become the major vanguard of authorizing better realities in light of their visions. They don't have just technocratic and managerial perspectives on the world. They have visionary conceptions of a better world that can guide us. This is what Shelley meant by poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. By poets, he didn't just mean versifiers. He meant all of those who use imagination and empathy to authorize a better reality. And this is why even at a STEM Senate University, never downplay your musicians, never downplay your poets. Let me stop there, brother. Let me, I'm going on much too long. I'm getting excited here at this wonderful institution. And I want to make sure we have good time for questions and queries. Well. Thank you very much. Um, oh, Brother Rob, Brother Rob. Yes, indeed. indeed. I'm here. I'm, I'm right next to you now. Uh-huh. Good to see you. Good to see you there, man. You know, I, I've had one question burning in my mind since we, I first, uh, your name popped up on my cell phone, uh, surprised as I was. And uh, we had that conversation with Lamine. And I said, you know, I've seen him a number of times live, but can he do it on Zoom? And he can. <laughs> oh, well, I, I appreciate it. I appreciate was, it. I, I, I want to thank you. This has been, um, I, I know I'm speaking for many people out in the, uh, the audience. Um, this has been a difficult time. And, uh, and especially the last few weeks, I think. And um, I want to thank you for lightening the load for us. Because mm. that was... Um, appreciate, appreciate that. Uh, so, uh, I'm but here. I know I, I'm, I'm following you because you're such a force for good on the ground at WPI. Brother Levine was telling me about you. He's telling me about you. <laughs> Indeed. Oh, well, I'm, uh, as many people have said in the chat, um, I'm, I'm honored to be here and I'm honored to be the person who's going to, um, uh, you know, um, moderate it from here on out. So thank you. Absolutely. Um, we do have some questions coming in and um, I'm gonna, I'll start with, uh, I'll go in order here for now. Um, uh, Dr. West, would you say the US is at a better point in, social, in the social justice realm today in 2021 or worse off than 20 years ago? Do you see the needle moving? Well, it's a wonderful question though. You know, I don't think that time is linear in that sense. Uh, you remember how Charles Dickens begins to tell the two cities this. It, you, you've got the best, you've got the worst. Sometimes the worst gets worse. Sometimes the best gets worse. Sometimes the worst gets a little better. Sometimes the best gets very worse. It, 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 it depends on where you're looking uh, in terms of when it comes to uh, the issues of poverty, when it comes to issues of wages, when it comes to issues of access to basic social needs, we're still in deep trouble, even though we're the richest nation in the history of the world, because the wealth that we're producing is extraordinary, but so much of it is hemorrhage at the top. Mm. You see? So we've got almost 40% of our population who are living month to month. That's a lot of people. This is what William Barber and this Poor People Campaign, building on Martin Luther King Jr.'s legacy is all about, you see. Uh, uh, so that when you, from, from that vantage point, no, no, we, 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 we're actually not making a lot of progress. Now, again, now under 
our dear brother Biden with these both relief bill and the infrastructure bill, he's actually hitting poverty head on, especially child poverty. That's crucial. That's very crucial uh, because Johnson had already hit uh, the elderly poverty, which used to be the group that suffered even more poverty than others, but he hit that hard in the 60s uh, with, with the war on poverty and various Medicare and Medicaid uh, programs. Uh, so that in that sense, with Biden, we might be able to see some effects and consequences to deal with this poverty, social misery, wage stagnation. Same is true in terms of trade union. That's why what's happening right now in Bessemer, Alabama is so very important. That's why my dear brother Bernie Sanders was just there two weeks ago uh, because he's, you got Amazon, you know, very, very uh, entrenched against any kind of unionization. Well, how are workers going to gain access to benefits and wages without having some institutional mechanism to do it? We'll see. You know, that, that's still up in the air. That's still up in the air. Uh, now, where have the breakthroughs been? Well, the breakthroughs have been, as I mentioned briefly, that we have among the middle classes, the educated classes, and the chattering classes uh, uh, of supposedly sophistication and refinement. You know, we won't go into whether that's true or not. But those are much more colorful now. But that's important. That's important, you see. Uh, uh, when you have the first sister, the first woman, president of WPI, that is worthy of celebration. There's no doubt about it but it's not just diversity. It's a diversity tied to quality. You've got the black woman deans at WPI. That's worth celebrating. Not just in the name of diversity, that diversity is inseparable from quality when you got the provost, my dear brother all. That's not just diversity, that's quality. That's worth celebrating. But that's still, of course, among the educated classes. It's among the professional managerial classes. Those breakthroughs are crucial, just like the black president. Very important, symbolic significance, overwhelming with Barack Obama. But then the question always is now, how will it translate for the working classes and the poor? That becomes the question, you see. So I don't wanna downplay the breakthroughs, but the problem is if this, if the only measure of racial progress is what's going on among the black middle classes, then we're missing. You're gonna miss mass incarceration. You're gonna miss guns and drugs and wrestling with despair, deep depression, dilapidated schools, what I was talking about before. And we have to be able to keep track of both. This is part of what I mean by being able to see. We have to be able to keep track of both. Very much so. So that's the beginning of an answer in terms of that, that needle. But just be suspicious for the one dimensional needle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's the key. Let me, uh, let me build off that point about what it's like to have um, one of the proudest moments of my professional life is when I brought in the uh, uh, Ghanaian ambassador to the US to uh, Higgins house. Wow. And I opened the front wow. door and I've got my President Lori Leshin, wow. Dean of Engineering, Wally Sobiejo, and Dean of Arts and Sciences, Gene King, to black people and a woman as the, as the leadership of our campus. And he let me know that. He, he let me know that he thought- That's that powerful, isn't it? That's powerful. A powerful thing. So let me ask you this. This comes from one of our students. He says, good evening, Brother West. Yes, my Bye. brother. He says, please advise and speak on the importance of groups like Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, National Society of Black Engineers, the Alliance and other groups to socially create change on WPI campuses and, uh, and other campuses. Thank you and greetings from Alpha Kappa, the Alpha Kappa chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha. Oh, this is my old six brother. Now see, now he's, he's, he's lovingly outing me and I'm so glad to be outed as an Alpha brother. <laughs> Absolutely. But when you think, again, of the exemplars, because we're not just talking about an organization in the abstract. W. D. B. Du Bois, the greatest public intellectual in the history of the nation. Alpha. Martin Luther King Jr., the greatest organic intellectual. Alpha. Duke Ellington. Alpha. Donnie Hathaway. 
alpha. John Hope Franklin, the greatest historian, alpha. What is it about them? It's not just their achievements. It's what they did with those achievements. Those achievements were means toward serving others and service is at the center of the alpha world worldview. And I know that brother understands that. Charles Wesley, we can go on and on and on. Uh, 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 so that, and this is true for any professional or middle-class organization. So the, the engineers, sharp, disciplined, brilliant, use your sharpness, discipline, and brilliance to be of service to others. To spread that hesed of Hebrew scripture to others, especially the vulnerable especially the weak. And those organizations do have a history, but at the same time, you know, every bourgeoisie that we know in the history of the modern world uh, has a uh, decadent wing, deeply narcissistic, deeply narrow and tribalistic and deeply egoistic and so forth. That needs to be called into question. See, so if you're a black middle-class person and all you're concerned about is just your money and your trip and buying your house at Martha's Vineyard, then you need some spiritual transformation. You need some shattering of your moral constipation. You need to be connected and in solidarity with other folk, not just black folk, but you can begin there in that sense. And the best of alpha, and that would be true for the best of AKA, I mean, Tony Mars, that, that would be the sorority uh, counterpart or the, the deltas of, of Dory, uh, Dorothy Irene Height. Uh, who's one of the towering figures who's a Delta, any of these middle-class organizations. But I have a deep suspicion of uh, any bourgeoisie because it tends to too often in its dominant forms generate persons who are well adjusted to injustice and well adapted to indifference. That's part of the callousness owing to their concern only with their own selves in their little small narrow platoon to use Edmund Burke's language. But tell my brother I appreciate that 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 06 question. He, he's uh he's uh we study together. Oh, oh uh, yeah you know you know AD. <laughs> now here's a question from uh one of those people I'm so proud to stand next to uh on a daily basis almost and that's uh Dean Jean King the uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences. And she says, Bro West, thanks for speaking about the role of arts in a STEM school. I'm thinking about the role of athletics and democracy. What are your thoughts? Ooh, first let me salute her. She's part of this wonderful leadership team that's making a difference. And WPI is a historic institution in the American democratic experiment. Now, it's very important to keep that in mind. See, I understand athletics as a uh, form of artistry. I was just with Dr. J, one of the greatest basketball players who was pure magic before Magic Johnson and who was an athletic artistic. Uh, uh, I had an athletic artistry before uh, Michael Jordan. So that athletics is a spilling over of the highest level of excellence, it's athletic excellence in this, which is a form of art because it does impose a beautiful, beautiful form and order on what seems to be a chaos. Uh, in the world and in time or on a football field or a basketball court uh, uh, or a golfing range. And, and so it can be a site for the cultivation of the kind of virtues that I'm talking about. Camaraderie, integrity, decency, transparency to the best of one's ability and so forth. And yet we know like everything else in our society, it's always already commodified. People want to make money. So you got to be tied to, you know, whatever agents you have and the contracts and all of the various uh, possibilities for commercials and so forth and so on. But uh, I would hope and pray that the arts in its broadest sense, which includes athletics, I appreciate my dear sister's query, uh, will play a very important role in shaping the souls of students, the precious students at WPI. Because without democratic, Socratic, prophetic soul craft, you're not going to have a democratic state's craft. And you're certainly not going to have any democratic possibilities in the economy. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you. Uh, here's another one from, uh, so, hello, Professor West. To begin with, I want to compliment you on your work and thank you for this wonderful lecture you gave all of us today. It was very uplifting and it reminded me once again of the great ideals we should follow in life. And then she goes on to say, or they go on to say, what approach would you suggest to someone who lives with people that believe in white supremacy? Well, I, I, well let me just say this. You know, when I was in Charlottesville, uh, right there up front with some of our real sick brothers who were members of the Klan and uh, Nazi parties and so forth. And uh, we had dialogues. We had dialogues. And, uh, and I started off by saying, you know, I got some white supremacy inside of me. I can't grow up in a white supremacist civilization and not, not have it inside of me. I try to fight it every day because I don't want to be a coward. I think to succumb to white supremacy is a coward. You calling me a coward? Well, I'm trying to be loving my brother, but I do think it's a form of coward. Convince me that it's not. But then he start cussing for a little while and I cool off. But then he comes back. You see. And, 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 and so we begin to recognize that our humanity is on a continuum. You see, it's not as if he's a pure gangster and I'm a pure hero. Then it turned out he's a Christian. I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, I was a gangster before I met Jesus and now I'm a redeemed sinner with gangster proclivities. What kind of redeemed sinner are you, my brother? And he's looking at me like, well, uh, uh, well, that's uh, uh, well, what kind of Jesus you following? I'm following the Jesus who went into the temple and ran out the money changers. And that temple was the largest edifice east of Rome with 400 Roman troops on one side, the bankers in the center, and the intellectuals rationalized the bankers and the troops of the Roman Empire. Jesus goes in two waves of security and still runs the money changers out. I said, is that the Jesus you following? Well, uh, 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 that sounds like communist propaganda. I said, well, you know, I wish we had a Bible. I would read you some scripture, brother. But th 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 there's still something to connect because there's something inside of human beings that always runs excess, that goes, that spills over beyond all of their gangsterism. And it flips the other way too. The people who you think are saints, they got something negative. And it spills over too. Because the saint ain't nothing but a sinner who looks at the world through the lens of the heart anyway. So that we did have some kind of connection. And so I want to tell this, 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 this sister that uh, don't give up on folk. Don't give up on people. LBJ was a diehard white supremacist from Jim Crow, Texas, who became one of the major forces for good against white supremacy as president. Who would have thought? You just don't know. People do change. Malcolm X was a gangster before Elijah Muhammad loved him out of the cell. He became one of the greatest prophetic voices and outgrew Elijah Muhammad. But he wouldn't have made it without Elijah Muhammad's love because Malcolm X was not always Malcolm X. He was Malcolm Little. LBJ was not always DLBJ, especially on domestic policy. We won't get into Vietnam. But on domestic, he was not always LBJ. People need to be pushed. People are changed. You don't give up on people. People are not static and stationary. They can change. And see, as a Christian, I believe each and every one of us made in the image of God. And therefore, there's always something that is inside of them, that, 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 that sanctity, that possible genuine inside of them that's worthy of trying to cultivate. And it means they can always go another way. They can always change. They can always undergo transformation or even in a narrow Christian sense of conversion. But that sense of uh, not being naive at all. And it's also a matter of, of, of holding on to what I call charitable Christian hatred, which is the hating of sin and trying to love the sinner. The hating of evil deeds and trying to stay in contact with the humanity of the evil doers because those evildoers can change. And how do we know? We just check ourselves. We check inside of ourselves. Have we ever done any evil? Oh no, no, quit lying, quit lying. Self-deception. Well, 
you want that evil deed or set of evil deeds to fully, thoroughly define who you are forever? No, but nobody else does either. That's why I call Trump brother. I get a lot of trouble for calling Trump brother. Ku Klux Klan folk brother. They say, brother, what's you sick? These people who trash your people, hating people, dominating people, and they steal your brother. Well, within the Christian sense, you are loving the image they're made in that same image that you are of God, and therefore they have a capacity to change. That's what I'm loving. I don't like their vicious actions. I don't like their hatred. I hate their deeds. But I'm trying to stay in contact with their humanity. And that's really just, you know, that's, that's, that's Sunday school. That's vacation Bible school. <laughs> Hating the sin and loving the sinner. But oh, it has tremendous implications. Tremendous implications. Has, has anybody ever said your smile's contagious? <laughs> <laughs> you very kind though, brother. We we just so much on the same wavelength though. I, I, I can feel your soul flow vibrate. You and I and Lamine, all three of us just kicking it together. And Brother Woolley too, and Sister Laura. And, oh, I want to thank Rachel too. Rachel Roy, she she's been wonderful. She has really been wonderful. She really has. So here's a question from another student. Uh, she's, uh, they say, I would like to know your thoughts on the fact that many of the issues and challenges we may be facing, there are other places, communities in the world that face the same issues, issues about class, race, and discrimination. But there seems little to no solidarity of humanity on a global scale. Take, for example, the COVID situation. Any advice on how we can think of solutions as a world community would be appreciated. I'm thinking of Edward Said on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. well, Edward Said is one of the great uh, public intellectuals in the last 50 years. He and Noam Chomsky uh, uh, would probably be two of the greatest ones. Uh, um, but when it comes to solidarity on a global scale, uh, it's there, but it's still very weak and feeble. And now, when I say solidarity, I'm talking about solidarity of persons who are fighting for poor and working people. I mean, global capital, I mean, corporate elites have intense solidarity, broad solidarity. Uh, that's part of what globalization was all about, was a certain solidarity of, 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 of capital to move around, but be tied to its profit ma maximizing ends and aims. But the, it's very difficult, but it is increasing. It is increasing, partly because of the new technologies, but also partly because, you know, we're facing an ecological catastrophe. And if we don't come together as a species that accent the best of who we are, then it would look as if we haven't cultivated the capacity to avoid self-destruction. And that's going to take international, global, cosmopolitan forms of communication, organization and movements. So that uh, I, I hear what they're saying, uh, they're weak, but I think, I think they're getting stronger. I think they're getting stronger. Thank you. Here's a question from one of our faculty members and he says, thank you for such a powerful talk. I'm wondering how you balance your insistence on resisting group labels to achieve individual moral courage on the one hand with the potential for collective action based on group identities on the other. Thanks so much for joining us today. Ooh, that was a wonderful question and salute the, that's professor, right? Yeah, professor, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I think that the, uh, see it's one thing to acknowledge the collective uh, labels or collective categories, but when it comes to solidarity, I would always argue our individual identities for at the deepest level must be rooted in integrity, honesty, generosity, and then solidarity, you see? So that, I mean, as much as I love black folk, love spend time with black folk, if I go to a nightclub, for the most part, it'd probably be majority black because I like, you know, the beats and the, and the move and the groove and everything, but everybody can come. But in the end, I know there's a lot of people there who I'm not on a, I'm not in deep solidarity when it comes to integrity and honesty. They, they, can, they, they can stab me in the back once the party's over. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, we had a good time, Brother West, but now, poof, <laughs> lack of integrity. Or, you know, if we're having a, a, a we're having some kind of, you know, political struggle, I mentioned Brother Clarence Thomas, you know, he's going to be on one side, I'm going to be on the other. We both black. I love the brother, even though I think he's wrong about 94% of the time, but, but, but we still got a human connection. But in the end, the kind of deep moral and spiritual integrity that I'm concerned about uh, is really not rooted at all in just skin pigmentation or just or, or sexual orientation or national identity. It's a spiritual and a moral grounding, a spiritual and a moral uh, basis and foundation. And that has to do with the virtues. You, you mentioned nightclubs and um, I was thinking back to you early in your talk and you mentioned Sly Stone and you had me there. <laughs> <laughs> you remember <old> Sly. Huh? <laughs> And see, we, we should remind the students now that Sly Stone, Sam Cooke, Curtis Mayfield, never won a Grammy. Millie Vanilli won two. Hmm. So it's not about the titles. It's not about the awards of a mainstream, of an establishment. Those three artists are three of the greatest artists of their generation. No Grammys at all. Meaning the establishment missed something. And then the young folk might not know who Millie Vanilli is, but you remember who Millie Vanilli is. I don't remember who Millie Vanilli is. Lip singing, they lip singing through the song and still get a Grammy. You say, please, 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 please. <laughs> well, we only have a few minutes left, and I've, I've, got, I've been saving one question for you that uh, mm -hmm. comes to your, uh, your. We, we can go over if you like. We, well, I know our dear sister president has the. Uh, the board meeting at six, though. But oh no, I can drop off. You all can keep going. You no, can keep, all right, keep, all keep the party indeed, going. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, indeed, right on, right on. Um, well, any, I'll go ahead with this question, and we can keep going. But uh, this uh, comes from uh, your dear friend Beth Eddy. Oh she yes. Says, uh, what can the youngest students at WPI, uh, those just starting on their journey here? think about the decisions offered to them to become more like more than careerist, but can they lay themselves on the line to perhaps change something in the world in the name of, uh, in the name of justice, courage, and applied intelligence? Mm, ooh, Sister Beth, always getting deep, always getting deep, I'm telling you. You know, I think so. I think that there's always going to be a cloud of witnesses, there's always going to be a, a significant number of young people of every generation who decide to be in the world, but not of it, who decide to be in the academy, but not fully of it, who decide to be in any organization, but not fully of it. So that there's something inside of them that is always over against the dominant tendency of any institution. And they can cultivate that by keeping in, in mind the great memories of the great examples of those who were in the world, but not of it, you know, who uh, the Corliss Lamonts, for example, at Harvard, you know, who's founder of the American Civil Liberties Union and uh, uh, supporter of W.B. Du Bois and Paul Robeson and his father was one of the biggest bankers in the history of America, you know. So you got Lamont Library at Harvard, but Carlos Lamont was the Bernie Sanders, like Democratic Socialists who founded ACLU, who, su who supported Du Bois and so on. And you have so many examples like that. The Laura Rockefellers from the Rockefeller family who provided so much significant resources for uh, the powerful feminist movement in the, 19, in the 1960s. People who are in, but not of, you know, the dominant tendencies of their family, for example. The straight brothers and sisters who who are in deep solidarity with their precious gays and lesbian peoples, you see. Why? Because they want to be persons who are concerned about the humanity of others, and therefore they're willing to give up a certain kind of uh, popularity in the name of integrity. We can go on and on and on. You know? Certain Brahmins who are in deep solidarity with Dalit peoples, uh, uh, going against oftentimes their family uh, uh, orientations in order to, to acknowledge the humanity of those who historically have been cast as untouchable, but who are dignified dollars. And we can get examples of that over and over and over again. 
Goyim who were in solidarity with Jews in a Poland or Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I'm on my way to Union Seminary right now to, and I'll occupy the Dietrich Bonhoeffer chair. Who was he? The Lutheran pastor who recognized that over 90% of the Lutheran church succumbed to Hitler. What does he do? He joins a group that's trying to kill Hitler in the name of Jesus. Now it raises all kinds of issues, theological and ethical, but that's what he did. And he was executed April 9th, 1945. As Christian witness, he's trying to engage in just war against the gangster. But see, he's in the church, but not of it. That way. And, uh, uh, and then we can think of other examples as well. You see, he didn't have to be Jewish in order to be in solidarity with a, uh, a regime that was massively uh, executing Jews, even though we also know they were they're executing gays and gypsies and communists and socialists, but it was largely disproportionately Jewish. Well, um, I will leave it there for now. And thank you so much for your time. I don't know, President Leshen, if you want to say a few words or Provost Sobiejo. Um, I will just say uh, your smile is infectious and your heart is uh, is one that we will not forget anytime soon. And I just want to thank you so much for um, honoring us with your your wisdom, your presence and uh, and your call to action. And uh, we will carry this with us for many, many years to come. And I'd love to let Wally say a few words as well. Thank you. thank you, Laurie. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Cornell, for a most inspiring, most inspiring talk. For me, you've challenged us with the essential question of what kind of human being do we choose to be? <laughs> and this is the fundamental question that all of us must ask ourselves. And, and as we do this in a Socratic way, um, look inside of ourselves and find the higher ideal beyond the superficial goals of uh, simple materialism and, and go beyond just what's in our brains to what's in our hearts, mm, yeah. right? And, and really it's that combination that then leads to real virtues of a life worth living. And, and, as I, and as I really think about it, this is a message for all of us. And within this context of sort of framing of the world, you feel for others, you see the world through the lenses of others, and you're compelled to act as an act of really driven by love for others and an act of a desire for change for a better world. And for all our STEM graduates and for all humans, this is a call to action for a world that is much bigger than us and for an approach that is filled with human love and forgiveness where we don't give up on anybody in spite of where they are today. And um, I really want to thank you for this perspective and the wisdom that you shared with us. I want to thank you for your exemplar life. And uh, it's been a true blessing to have you here with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Brother West. Oh, my dear brother, your eloquence got to the core. Of, I wish I could say it like that. I'm telling you, your eloquence got to the core of what I was trying to get at. Thank you. So I'm not surprised you do that all the time, but, but I salute you, my brother. Thank you so very much for having me. And uh, just thank you for being all that you are. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for really supporting this uh, university lecture. Thank you, Cornell. Really appreciate you and what you stand for.